this morning. You know, what a simple thing, because Jesus is referred to as the second Adam, right? The last Adam. There was a first Adam, and the first Adam goofed things up pretty good for us. And how did he do it? What did Adam do wrong? What did he do wrong? He disobeyed God. How did he do that? Well, you know the story, right? He partook of something he shouldn't have. He ate. Did he not? He ate. And he wasn't supposed to. So by eating, he fell out of favor. By eating, God's turned it around. By eating, we get the fullness of the blessings. Okay? Because some people say, well, this is so simple. Of course it's simple. Everything God does is simple. It's so simple I can understand it. All right? It's so simply our children can understand it. Thank you, guys. So, so with that, Adam, Adam partook of something and defiled himself. We partake of this because we're looking to Jesus. And now the whole thing is reversed. The curse is reversed. And now there's blessing and there's healing and there's prosperity. Okay? There's strength. There's everything you need today as we take communion. Hallelujah. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're honoring the Lord in today. And we're celebrating. In your heart, I hope you're celebrating. It's all about Jesus. Amen? All right, bless the Lord. So let's look to the Lord this morning. The scripture says that when we do this, when we partake of this, Jesus said, you do this in remembrance of me. Not of yourself, not of your sins, your failures, your struggles. Remembrance of me. Not even remembrance of the first Adam. We do it in remembrance of the last Adam. The one who turned it all around. And he did it just for you. He did it just for you because he loves you because you're so special to him. You might have had a bad week. You may be struggling right now with an issue in your life, and that is, in the sight of God, totally irrelevant. Now, God does want to make, we're not making light of struggles. We're not making light of even, you know, addictions and sins. But what we're saying is that those things will never separate you from the love of God. What could ever separate you from the love of God? Nothing. While you, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then? How much more? And so if you have a need in your life right now, and especially if there's a physical need, would you just discern the Lord's body today? And as we're taking this in your heart, you're just saying, Jesus, thank you. You were beaten for me. You were broken for me. Yes, you died so my sins could be forgiven. But beyond that, you took such a horrible, horrible beating just so that I could be set free and that I could be healed and made whole. And so as we discern the Lord's body today, we thank you, Lord. We'll be strong and we'll be healthy. And now we're going to take this bread in remembrance of you, Lord Jesus. Let's take it together. Hallelujah. And so after the supper was ended, they took the cup, and Jesus said, this cup now is a very special cup. Because what it is, it's the new covenant in my blood, meaning that now your sins are forgiven. So we understand we have healing, wholeness, but we're also forgiven. You're forgiven of everything you've ever done. And with that, now we're free to forgive others and to live in that place of real health and and confidence in God. Because we're not holding grudges. We're not angry. We're not carrying things in our life that we were never meant to carry. As God has forgiven us, we're forgiving everybody. We're releasing people. We're blessing. Jesus said you can even bless your enemies. We can bless everybody. Because we were once enemies with God, but we've been reconciled by the blood of Jesus. So this cup is powerful. It's reminding us we are totally forgiven. We're totally righteous in the sight of God. And now we live in that place of forgiveness. Now we're dispensers of God's love and forgiveness to other people. Because we have a sure covenant. It's not based on good works. It's not based on anything you do. It's based on what Jesus already did for you at the cross. And so we rejoice in this now. And let's take this. Lord Jesus, we're taking this cup in remembrance of you. Let's take it together. Pass your cups to the end of the aisle, please.
Testament Summit. So tomorrow night, teenagers are getting dropped off here. We're going on a photo scavenger hunt. Pickup will be at 9 p.m. an extra half an hour. At Chick-fil-A, we haven't been there yet as a youth group. Like, hello, we got to check that out. So more chicken for us. That's tomorrow night, inside out. And then this Friday, family night being sponsored by Jumpstart is a movie outdoors. So that is happening at dusk. Come join us. Bring lawn chairs, blankets, bug spray maybe. And we are going to have a movie under the stars. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now save the date because the Monday after Labor Day is the 10th. And that is our next New Testament Summit, which is why we don't have Inside Out. This is for anybody who oversees a ministry here at New Testament. Also, those who are involved in a ministry that want to be here, this is an opportunity for you to learn and grow and become a better leader and learn some things happening at the church and grow in your skills with people as Pastor Dad teaches us some good wisdom and nuggets of leadership that is happening and it's only one hour right here at the church so save that day the new testament summit on the 10th also i mean we are talking save the date but it's going to be here before you know it is our marriage retreat if you are married we want to help strengthen your marriage with jesus so invest in your marriage it is going to be happening on the 4th 5th and 6th of october that is a thursday night through saturday we are going to grand island we have a hotel with rooms saved there you can sign up at the welcome desk a hundred dollars is a deposit needed for your room we will keep giving you details as that day approaches but new testament your marriage is important and your family hinges on your marriage. We want to strengthen your marriage and in a world where the enemy tries to divide our marriages, we want to see Jesus strengthen them. So save that day in your pennies and quarters because we are excited to invest into your marriage. That is coming up in October. So we just want to give a shout out to someone in our church who has used the gifts God has placed in them to share about Jesus. So on your way, give Ron and his wife a high five, and you can check out that book that uh, they have written. Awesome stuff. Good morning, New Testament Church. I'm Greg Williams. Just a heads up info about the authors of a new book. Ron and Donna Hebblethwaite, Miracle and Healing Book, 68 Stories of God's Deliverance and Faith and Their Involvement Over a 48-Year Period. A great read, many exciting and touching stories. And it's uh, from word that's out, it's uh, also hard to put down once you start. Oh. Okay, and it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and an autographed copy here at the church. God bless and have a great day. Back to Trump. Oh, New Testament, we are not done because we are looking for people who want to host or lead Discover Groups. Discover Groups are the small groups here at New Testament. So whether you want to open up your home to host a group and have somebody else come in and lead that group, or you want to open up your home and lead the group yourself, or you want to host a group somewhere in our community, like at Starbucks or one of the hipster places downtown, like... What is that awesome, cool? Glen Edith, New Testament. If you haven't been to Glen Edith, Christian owned and operated and good stuff. And it's hipster though. So you want to host a group in the community. You want to host a group around the Sunday message with questions provided to you. 
you have a topic you want to do or even an activity you want to do, then now is the time for you to grab one of these pamphlets in the atrium today and fill it out because you would make a great host or leader. So right now we're looking for people to host groups and then once we have those groups ready, we will tell the rest of you what group you can get involved in to grow and build relationship. It's going to be great. A New Testament Jumpstart. It is time for you to be dismissed. Jumpstart to your Jumpstart classes. Have a blast. Everybody else, get up and say hi to people around you. Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Testament Christian Church. Thank you. So responsive. I love it. You are so excited today. I love that during the entire Welcome to Church video, we were still greeting. That is my favorite. That's okay. I'm okay with you guys being overly friendly. It's not too weird. All right. Today, I am going to talk to you a little bit about fear and fear of God and what that looks like in your life. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a really embarrassing thing about myself. I know you're all really excited now. You're like, Ooh, what are you going to say? Um, I have an irrational fear. He's at the edge of his chair. Great. I, sh I'm, I hope you're taking notes. Um, I have this ridiculous fear of not anything that like normal people fear, like man-eating beasts or... I, I don't know. What else are people afraid of? Clowns, maybe? Spiders. Lori's afraid of spiders. I am terrified of going to the doctor's office. And that is so ridiculous. And I know it's ridiculous. That doesn't help me. Okay? I go to the doctor's office, and I'm sitting there in the waiting room. By the way, Joe, this is really loud. Maybe you can turn me down just a tad. Please and thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so I go to the waiting room, and I'm sitting there hyperventilating and, like, trying to keep the anxiety from boiling over and, like, affecting everyone that I'm around. And I'm thinking, okay, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to get into the examining room, and they're going to throw me, like, that stupid little paper trash garment thing that you're supposed to put on when you go to the doctor. You know what I'm talking about. You've all had a physical before, right? Yes? Okay. Thank you. It's, it's so undignifying and humiliating. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get in there and be humiliated. And then they're going to do the ear, nose, and throat examination. And I'm going to end up just having to get a strep throat test, which is so great because everybody loves those. And from there, they're going to want to take a whole bunch of blood for I don't know what reason. And I hate needles so much. I'm so afraid of needles. They're so bad. And from there, I'm sure that I'm going to end up in an MRI or a CAT scan or an X-ray, and I'm going to be diagnosed with all these horrible things. 
And I can't explain to you why I have these fears, but that's just how it is. I want you to know that, first of all, God is working on my heart a little bit, so I'm less of an anxious freak when I go into the doctor's office. I'm not going to die of a heart attack in the waiting room. It's going to be okay. But uh, I want to talk to you about fear of God and that it should not be that way at all. The title of my message today is Who's Really in Charge? And it seems a little confusing because it's like fear, who's really in charge. They don't really seem to go together with my mixed-in phobia of physicians. But just bear with me for a little while because by the time we're done, it's going to all come full circle. So Psalm 112, verse 1, we're going to look at really quick. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. And Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And this is the verse that I was reading when God plopped this sermon on my heart. He was like, you need to preach on the fear of God. And I said to him, no, thank you, Lord. I will preach on something that's a little less touchy and relevant and personal and all that fun stuff. And so I tried to find something else. I tried to find a different verse to tear apart or a different topic. And you know that they didn't work out. And so Jesus and I negotiated, and now I'm preaching on the fear of God. (laughs) He won, yes. And so once I agreed to preach this, because it was what the Lord had given me to say, he really started convicting my heart. Because when it came down to it, I was not currently practicing the very thing that he was giving me to preach. Like, I literally was not the definition of practicing what you preach. I was actually avoiding it completely. It got so quiet so fast. (laughs) Yes. So before we get started, I want you to know this isn't something that I have a master's degree in. This is something that I believe the Lord has given me. He's really let a lesson settle on my heart long enough to kind of break me a little bit. And out of that place of brokenness but healing, I feel like I'm able to share with you this morning what I've learned so far. So instead of saying, this is exactly how you do this seamlessly with absolutely no issues, follow this step-by-step process, I'm going to instead just say, please come and just, and just be on this journey with me to learn more about this. Is that okay today? Perfect. They are way louder than this side. I don't know. Like, they're really excited over here. You guys are a little mellow. And Lori's on this side. Yes, I love it. And Pastor Jim's not taking any. Unbelievable. I'm only kidding. Only kidding. Okay, so what is the fear of the Lord? Fear in its complete and literal definition, is an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. It's reason for alarm. It's anxious concern. These are all things that are literal to the human experience. We have all experienced this. We know what fear is. But what I found when I was looking at definitions is that Merriam-Webster said, fear is also profound reverence and awe especially toward God. And I thought that was so cool. I was like, okay, thank you, Miriam. You just preached my sermon for me. With that, you guys can just get ready to go right out and get your second cup of coffee because we're good to go. But fear of God is a little different. And I want to talk to you about what fear of God is not really quick because that's also very important. Fear of God is not something that should make you tremble or be afraid of him, but we're going to get into that. Fear of God is not motivated by guilt. So often, I think we can get this subconscious link in our minds, this thing that takes us back to Genesis 3 at the fall of man, where Adam and Eve really messed up there. If we want to look at that today, it's Genesis 3, verses 8 through 10. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Adam and Eve sinned, and doing so damaged who they were. It damaged their relationship with God. Sin became the barrier between man and God. And they were so overcome by this guilt and by this shame that they actually tried to hide themselves from the Creator like from the, from the God who created them, from the God that they walked so intimately with every moment before then, they tried to hide because of their guilt. 
And fear of God is not something that makes God unapproachable. I want you to know that today. It's not supposed to make you want to hide from him. God does not want a barrier between him and you. This kind of fear that Adam and Eve exemplify, it's backed by their flesh. And you know what? It's exactly what we want to do. When we come into that place of saying, God, yes, I know that I've done this thing wrong. Please just say over there, my, my sin is too great. It's our default. When we're anticipating an unpleasant encounter, we want to run. At least I do. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you're braver than I am. God doesn't want you to have a mindset that says, I can't get to God, or God, this sin is too filthy. Please just stay away from me. He is not distant by any means, and he is certainly not unapproachable. He is closer than your very breath. Fear of God is not fear of getting into trouble. <laughs> Got a funny story. When I was a kid, I was like perfect child in school. Okay, perfect child in school. And then I came home and I was the most rotten little stink there ever was. And I didn't care if I did something wrong. I cared if I got caught doing something wrong. So like if I did something, I don't know. I don't even know what I would do. But if I did something and got away with it, I was like, whatever. But if I ever heard from downstairs my three names come out of somebody's mouth, the famous Miranda Jilly Egner. I knew it was all over with. Like, I was so deep into it, I would never recover. And then my vision of heaven got a little more, you know, a little closer to me. It was not a fun time. But fear of God should not be fear of getting into trouble. And fear of God also shouldn't be the fear of getting, um, going to hell. Fear of going to hell isn't equivalent to a fear of God, by any means. And... Fear of spending eternity there really shouldn't be your motivation for fearing God. You're not meant to be terrified of him, that he could just snap his fingers at any moment and erase you from existence completely. He's not sitting up there at the edge of his seat, just waiting, like waiting for an excuse to send you there. Like, oh, if you could have messed that one up just a little bit more, it would have been all over with. Like, that's not who God is, okay? God is good. Fear of God is not built on a law that says do to be saved. It's not based on a legalistic mindset because, because we're under the covenant of grace. It's silly to think that in order to consider myself in right standing with God that I need to go down this list of do's and don'ts and make sure that I don't mess up. It's ridiculous to think that way. Under the old covenant, yes, God's people had to live by the law. They had to offer um, atonement for their sin, their sacrifices, like blood sacrifices to atone for their sins. But because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we no longer have to follow any sort of redemption program, any sort of um, sacrificial anything, any religious sacrifices. We don't have to do that. We don't have to offer a sacrifice for every time that we sinned. If we did have to do that, I will tell you, Sam's Club and BJ's would have sacrificial lambs and goats and turtle doves and all of it on... <laughs> they'd have it in stock. They'd have it on back order. They'd be out of it. Okay? Praise the Lord that we are not under the old covenant. Thank you. Yes, I love the feedback. Fear of God is not irrational like my um, physician phobia. And fear of God is not something that causes anxiety or confusion in your heart. That's really important. Psalm 128, verse 1. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. So I have pretty much gone down the list of everything that I could think of that fear of God is not, in which case I think we're going to actually start talking about that thing now. So fear of God is the affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his father's will. I thought that was so good when I found that definition. It's the affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his father's will. And reverence is simply the proper respect and honoring of God. And reverence comes, comes from relationship. That's so important. You can't you can't accomplish this part of your faith story without relationship. Reverence is the fear of God. Not that it's like a begging, cowering, trembling fear, like, oh, God, please don't hurt me. Like, I can't, I can't get that close to you. Please don't hurt me. That's not what it is. Reverence is the proper respect and honor that the creature owes to the creator. It's the proper respect and honor that the redeemed owes to the redeemer. It's the same respect that a child learns to have for their father. I really respect my dad. 
Okay. If you had asked either one of the, like either one of us, me or my dad, that same question when I was a teenager, we would have both had very different answers. <laughs> but you know what? I know that my dad loves me. And I know that even when I was a brat as a kid, he wasn't just sitting around waiting for me to fall on my face so he could laugh. He was awesome. Like my dad was always there for me. I know that my dad loves me deeply. And because he loves me, he's going to guide me. He's going to discipline me. But he's always going to help me stay on the right path. And in the same way, I need to let my fear of God develop and become an unwavering pillar of my faith. To know that he is, first of all, he is always good. My, my heavenly father always loves me. He is always good. And because he loves me and he is always good, he's going to discipline me sometimes. And I'll tell you what, if you get disciplined by God, it is really not fun. And it's not great. But it's because he is good, and it's because he wants good for you. So because I know that my heavenly father loves me, and he is always good, I know that he's going to discipline me, but he's going to guide me, and he's going to be with me, and I will never be without his presence and without his grace. <laughs> I revere my heavenly father as the king of the universe, and yet I love him as my savior and my redeemer. Reverence is a worshiping submission to the God of the covenant. And ultimately, to revere God is an expression of respectful submission to his will. Now, I know that can sound a little bit intense or a little scary, like submission to his will almost sounds like we don't have a choice, but that's totally not the case. That's totally not true. And aside from that, the will of God for your life is exponentially better than what you could ever think or imagine. The will of God for you is so much better than you could ever think. Like I said before, God is good. He's not sitting up in heaven just ways to think, like thinking of ways to bring you to your demise. He's good. And because he is good, he wants good for you. Submission to the will of God is not volunteering yourself to be an evil master slave. I want you to know that today. Submission to the will of God is positioning yourself to be a servant to the most high, the most gentle, and the most kind king. It's positioning yourself to be living the fullest life for you in relationship with God. Whose will do you really want to carry out? Who's really in charge of your life? And that brings us to our next little section here. Fear of God and reverence, it equals lordship. I'm going to just give you a glimpse into the mind of Jilly really quick. When I see the word lordship on something, here's exactly the picture I get. I'm like, okay, there's a lordship, and then there's a bunch of tiny little ships. And the lordship just guides all the little ships through the expanses of time and space. And I know that that's super nerdy, and that's totally not what we're talking about. So I'm going to stay on track. But I thought that you would appreciate that. So, no, it's not very good. It's hilarious. <laughs> so to call Jesus Lord, to really call Jesus Lord, is to announce him as the master of your life. To call Jesus Lord is to acknowledge him as the one who leads your life. And submission to him as Lord is branding yourself as a servant of God. To say you truly are God and so you truly are in control. Lordship is confessing that you serve Jesus with your life no matter the cost. Amen. Lordship is simultaneous with complete and total surrender to him first and therefore his will. So what does that look like in my personal life and my relationship with God? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> when it really comes down to it, Submitting to the Lordship of Christ is fully, surrender, fully surrendering everything. Saying, God, you are in charge of my person. That means all of you. That means everything that encapsulates who you are, your thought life, everything. Your, your fears, your worries, all the things that would f you think, everything that you think would fall apart if you stopped giving it every anxious thought. Okay, you give him your person. Saying, God, you're in charge of my possessions. That's everything that he has blessed you with to begin with. Okay, finances included. God, you're in charge of my positions, your job, your memberships, even your social status. And that one can be kind of tricky sometimes. God, you're in charge of my pains. 
every single thing that has ever hurt you, every single thing that has ever broken your heart, saying, God, you know what? You're in charge of that. Saying, God, you're in charge of my problems. I'm sorry, I skipped one. We're going to go back. God, you're in charge of my passions. It's a little more fun than problems. The dreams and aspirations that you have, that he gave to you, the hobbies that you love, the people that you love, the things that really set your heart on fire, saying, God, you're in charge of that. You gave them to me, you're in charge of that. And lastly, giving him charge of your problems. This is everyday, everyday struggles, people. The things that you face day to day. All the struggles, all the worries, every decision that you have to make, giving him charge. I could keep going on, but not everything starts with P. So I figured <laughs> the rest you can probably fill in. <laughs> There's something that is completely inseparable from this idea of lordship and submission. It's something that goes very closely. And that thing is obedience. Obedience is the outcome of a life that is fully submitted to God. And obedience is the act of voluntarily submitting yourself to his authority and his discipline. Voluntarily submitting yourself to his authority and discipline. To call Jesus Lord of my life is to give him all of it, truly. To submit everything I say, everything that I think, everything that I do, everything that I feel. To submit every single plan and decision that I have to make to him. But I want to tell you something. The action step of submission is to obey what he says when you submit it. The action step of submission is obedience. That is so important. I just lost my spot in my notes. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Obedience is better than sacrifice in the eyes of the Lord. He values obedience more. He values you following what he has to give to you, what he has to offer you, more than going through every religious act saying, I have to do this, so I'm doing it. I want to let you know a couple of things about obedience. Sometimes sacrifice is the outcome of obedience. You're like, well, what are you talking about? You literally just said obedience is better in the sight of God. Yes, that's true. But sometimes sacrifice is the outcome of obedience. When, st- when God starts to move on your heart to do something, to go somewhere, to stop doing something, really to make any sort of change in your life, it might feel like a personal sacrifice to you. I'm going to tell you right now. Oftentimes, when God's getting you ready to be propelled forward, to be propelled into a new thing, to be drawn deeper into intimacy with him, he may ask you to surrender some things to him. And let me, get this, let me just straighten this out with you. It's not like a trade-off. It's not like, hey, Pastor Jim, I need you to give me your love of brownies so that I can give you more of this to preach about or so I can make you like the super president pastor of Rochester. It's not like a power struggle or like a trade-off of any sort or kind. It's God asking you to surrender something that isn't good for you, most likely. It could be anything. It could be a habit. It could be a hobby. It could be a desire. It could be a sin pattern or a favorite thing. It could be a relationship or a portion of your income. It could be a five-year plan that you are, like, holding on to until your knuckles are white. But what happens when we, when we do it, when we lay down the thing that God is asking us to let go of, when we walk in obedience, is he does it. He propels us forward. He takes us to the new thing. He draws us deeper into relationship with him. It's like obedience is the door that opens wide for God to go and do whatever he wants to do. I can say from very recent experience that obedience is not always easy. And giving up something that you feel like you dearly love, it's not always easy. And I know that I'm not the only one who has experienced any sort of pain from obedience, but I want to know, I want to let you know today that it is always, 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 100 billion percent without a shadow of a doubt worth it. It is always worth it. So I want to ask, do you trust God enough to do what he asks you to do? 
Do you trust him enough to let go of or lay down the things that he's asking you for? Do you trust him enough to take that step of faith when he says, hey, go over there? Do you trust him enough to take the step when you actually can't see the step that you're taking? Like, it just looks like you're kind of stepping into a cloud. You're like, okay, God, I'm not dead, so I guess this is good still. Do you have that sort of trust in Jesus? If not, I want to let you know it is okay. For the longest time, I wasn't brave enough to do what God was asking me to do. I had asked or kind of, I I told God. I was like, look, God, I accept that this is what you're saying, but I do not have the strength to do it, and I, I can't. So really what I was saying to him is I won't. And this approach to obedience is really less effective, and it could be damaging to your destiny. Okay? It could be damaging to who you are. It could be damaging to your relationship with God. In my heart at that point in time, I was not yet fully submitted to his will. I was desperately clinging to what I wanted the most. And I was fighting him for the position of Lord in my life. I finally came to a place in my heart where I said, you know what, God? Okay. And I could do what, I, what he had asked me to do. But mind you, my heart took some serious prompting. I know now, though, that if I had listened and followed the initial prompting, I would have saved myself so much hurt and heartache. I believe that... Yeah, we'll save that for later. <laughs> if you find yourself in that place that I was, where you, where you say, you know what, I don't think I can trust God with that. That seems like a little too precious, or you know what, I don't have the strength to do this. I need you to listen very carefully to the next section, because this is just for you. The fruit of obedience is always blessing. The fruit of obedience is always deepened intimacy with God. The fruit of obedience is always increased trust in him. Obedience is an act of trust. That's why it increases your trust. And something God has really been teaching me in this season of my life is that trust in him is completely, totally crucial. I can't fully submit to God without trusting in him. And I can't fully obey someone that I constantly second guess. Trust really is the core of every relationship you have. I don't know if you've noticed that, but even in your friendships and in your marriages, I've never actually been to like a premarital or marital class, but I'm pretty sure they would have to mention that somewhere, like make sure you trust the person that you're trying to spend the rest of your life with. Because I I don't know how it's going to work out if you don't. Like that's kind of like one of the keys. But if I don't trust in the Lord, what foundation is there to my relationship with him? If I can't trust the most trustworthy one there is, who can I trust? Certainly not myself. I know of people who have been asked by God to do some pretty crazy things. I was sitting in my office a couple of weeks ago, just kind of letting my mind wander, which I don't suggest you do at work, but I did. And I was like you know what, God, people have left the company. It would really stink to get fired right now for whatever reason. And then he was like, well, what if I asked you to quit your job? And I just kind of sat there. I was like, please don't do that because I've got rent to pay and I've got this bill to pay and this bill to pay and I've got groceries to buy and eat. And that is very important, Jesus, you know that. And then I thought of these people that God had asked to quit their job before who are the head of the family, who are either the main source of income for that family, or they are one of two very important sources of income. I've, I, I remembered people that God had said, hey, pack up your stuff and move to China. Or, hey, pack up your stuff and move across the country to serve at a church. And I realized not one of them went unprovided for. The people who had kids and a mortgage payment and a car payment and whatever else and probably a dog and kids to feed and clothe and all that fun stuff, they quit their job because God told them to and they did not go unprovided for. God was faithful. And this whole little exchange in my work office with the Lord really opened my eyes. I was like, Jesus, increase my trust in you. Make me so faithful to obey you that I would. I would just walk away if you would ask me to. And I've made this commitment. If you ask me to quit my job, I'm like, ba-bam, I'm out of here. (laughs) I want to tell you something. God is not going to set you up for failure. He's not going to betray your trust when your trust is fully in him. 
He's good. And he's not up there thinking of ridiculous things for you to do just so he can see you fall on your face. It's not like he's bumping with the Trinity, being like, hey, watch, watch me ask them to do this thing and then they fail. It's going to be great. It's going to be hilarious. Like, they don't joke up there with themselves. I don't think about that kind of stuff. If you don't trust God enough yet to take the step of faith that you feel like you maybe need to or to follow what he's saying in any way or capacity, you need to know that God is not going to ask you to do something that his grace, that his strength, that his presence will not empower you to do. The faith, or I'm sorry, the fruit of obedience is always blessing. I'm going to say this again because it's so important. The fruit of obedience is always blessing. The fruit of obedience is always increased trust in God. And the fruit of obedience is always deepened intimacy with the Lord because you're exercising it. Trust really is like a muscle. It's like one of those spiritual muscles kind of deal, if you, if you would go there with me. We all know that Pastor Lori goes to the gym, Right? I want my trust muscle to be bigger than her biceps. Like, that is my goal, to be so ready to just do whatever God tells me to do. And it might take me a while, but I will get there in the name of Jesus. (laughs) So who is really in charge? Who's really in charge of your life? To revere God out of relationship with him is the beginning of revelation to who he is and what he wants for your life. I'm going to offer you a little equation that is already up there, and I'm glad that it's already up there. I am bad at math, so there is no math in it. Reverence plus relationship equals obedience. So giving God proper honor and respect, everything that he deserves, combined with my knowledge that God loves me, that he is so faithful, that just prompts me to want to obey him. It prompts me to want to follow where he leads me. It prompts me to want to do anything that he asks of me. Who's really in charge of your life? Honestly, in that time, for a little while, I was in charge of my life, and it was really not fun. It was pretty awful. I'd been torn in the deepest part of my soul between the will of God and the will of me. And I thought my will was so much easier and so much better and there would be so much less hurt right here. And so I tried to like push mine over just a little bit or like bring his a little bit closer, but that's not how it works with the Lord. I can honestly uh, tell you that if I'd obeyed the voice of God the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time or the sixth time or the seventh time, however many times I heard it, I really would have saved myself a lot of heartache, but as I was walking in that delayed obedience, which is disobedience, God's grace never left me. God's love for me did not lessen. God's love for me did not waver, and it is the same for you. God's love for you does not change. It does not waver. It does not lessen. No matter how good you're doing, no matter how bad you're doing, no matter how many times a day you read your Bible, no matter if you haven't picked up your Bible in six months, God's love for you does not change. It's not an amount that fluctuates depending on you. God can never love you more, and he could never love you less. I believe the result of delayed obedience which is disobedience, really, if we're being honest. The result of disobedience is hurt and damage and hurt to you and hurt to your relationship with God, damage to your destiny. And I am pretty positive that if you let this take root in your heart, if you, let, if you just keep walking in this delayed obedience, eventually it turns into rebellion against God in your heart. And we so want to avoid that. That's so not good. I have made a decision in my heart, church. I've decided that no matter what, no matter the cost, no matter what God asks me to give up, I give him full control of my life. I submit fully to his lordship. And I'm not going to snag the steering wheel again, especially when the road gets bumpy. I have a renewed sense of what it means to revere God from this. 
Like it's given me a renewed sense of what it means to have holy respect for him, to give him control of my life and to obey him out of relationship with him. Not saying, okay, God, you're God. And so I have to do this thing. I just know I have to do this thing because you're God and you told me to do it. That's not what we're getting at here. Obedience is one of the fruits of relationship with Jesus because you know who you're obeying. I've learned that although obedience is greater than sacrifice in the eyes of the Lord, a lot of times obedience is holding the hand of sacrifice. When your intimacy with God deepens, when you've been in a relationship with him a long time, when your commitment to him gets a little deeper through the struggles. And I've learned that for me, my heart knows peace when I follow his leading, when I obey him. And when I plug my ears to the voice of God, I feel such inner turmoil and disaster And there's so much double-mindedness within me. My challenge to you today, get ready, it's going to be fun. My challenge to you today is to come to that same place. To come to a place of being able to trust in the Lord fully. To to, To be able to say, okay God, look, I don't feel like I have the strength to do this, but I know that you love me and I know that you're good. And because you love me and because you're good, you're empowering me to do this, so I'm going to do it. Who's really in charge of your life? It doesn't matter what decision we're talking about here. I would ask you today to consider praying that God would fully take control of your life, that he would truly be Lord. And I would challenge you to open your heart completely. Like, sometimes you can kind of talk to God and it's like the door is only halfway open. You're kind of whispering out one side and he's kind of saying something back, but you're not completely like open with him because you're afraid of what he's going to say. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. I think we need some time to just be raw and be with Jesus. Let's just be ready to receive what he has to say, to to recommit or resubmit whatever you need to do this morning, whatever he asks of you, knowing that it's because he loves you so deeply. So I'm going to actually have Brent come up, and we're going to do one of the the songs from our set list. The lyrics that we're going to sing really quick. Our, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you, and I will not be shaken. And that part right there gets me every single time we sing it, because it's like, yes, God, I put my trust in you. And I know how hard it is, church. I am a control freak. And for control freaks, it's really hard to give someone else control of anything. So I know that it's difficult to just lay everything down to Jesus. But that's what we're going to do this morning. I want to offer you one more illustration really quick before we get down to the, the touchy-feely ending part of the service. I like to think of really intense sacrifice, something that God has asked you to give up because it's not good for you. I like to think of it like someone who goes to the doctor for an infected leg. And this is not my doctor phobia coming through, okay? This is really just an illustration that the Lord gave me a couple of days ago. But when someone has a dramatic infection in their leg that they cannot heal from, sometimes the doctor might actually have to amputate your leg surgically. And you know what that's for? It's to save your entire body. It's to save all of you from dying because of that infection. Sometimes you need to remove what's not good for you. And you know what? It's going to be uncomfortable for a while because you got to learn to walk with a leg and a half. But as you keep going, as you keep going, you get stronger and it gets easier. You get stronger and it gets easier. And your, your sense of who God is and your closeness with him increases so much. Your trust in him increases so much. Whatever the Lord asks you to do is for your benefit. I'm just, I'm going to make you all really uncomfortable right now. Let's just all close our eyes for a minute or two. No peeking. Only I'm allowed to peek. If there's anyone in this room that would say, you know what, I've never actually submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. I don't actually know what that looks like. And although this message was a little scary, I'm kind of interested in what it feels like to follow Jesus. If you'd just pop your hand up for me really quick. 
Awesome. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. All right, you can open your eyes and put your hands down. Hands down before eyes are open. Protect everybody. (laughs) I'm going to open up the altar this morning, and especially if you are someone who says, I need to submit my life to Jesus. I need to give him control of my life. I need to say, God, you are Lord of my life. I want you to come up and receive prayer for that, but I want you to just come and be with Jesus and spend some time with him regardless. Just be with Jesus. Just hear whatever he has to say this morning. And I know that we, I said we were going to sing something and I forgot to sing it, but we'll get there. So right now we're just going to take a few minutes just to prime this atmosphere to hear from Jesus. And after the song is over, if you feel like you're like, okay, I got this one in the bag. Like I have no worries with this. I am all good to go. Then please go grab another cup of coffee. Go socialize in the atrium. Go have a good time. But for those of you who need to just sit and just think and just be with Jesus and hear what he has to say to you, just stick around for a little while. Come up to the altar with the prayer team. Just be here. Thank you, Lord Jesus. make our way up to the altar if that's as the Lord is leading you. If you need prayer today, come up to the altar. Just come on up. God, I thank you for a renewed sense of trust in this place, a renewed sense of who you are, a renewed sense of reverence unto you. And I just pray that you would bless your people in this place today, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. All right, you guys can have a great Sunday if you're not going to stick around for a little more prayer. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your coffee.